In this video, I want to explore the concept of tribalism, or more specifically racism, as it pertains to certain ideas and arguments put forth by MRAs, notably Dean Esme, who endearingly refers to me as Eeyore. In his response video to Barbarossa, he frequently made use of reference to the American Civil Rights Movement, where that movement and men's rights are depicted as largely uh, analogous, at least in certain regards. I ultimately believe that the analogy is specious, and that speaking of the civil rights of a particular group, in this case black Americans, defined by their skin color, and men, a group defined by its sex, is a case of apples and oranges, though the two seem deceptively similar on the surface. So let's begin with exploring what racism is, and why, in my assessment, it is far more easily done away with than misandry and male disposability. Because, I recall, Dean has stated that male disposability is the problem. <clears throat> Let me first clarify that I do not see anything unique about racism, in that I lump it in with all forms of tribalism, all of which I summarily reject. It just happens to be the one based on physical attributes and thus seems to be different from, say, religious or political tribalism, but the pr principles behind it are the same. To understand tribalism, one must understand that virtually all aspects of human life, no matter how modern our world might be, are driven by two imperatives, survival and reproduction. Everything we do can be assigned to one or both of those imperatives, and thus it is no different with tribalism. Specifically, tribalism is a manifestation of in-group, out-group thinking, which in prehistory was very important to the survival of the species. Tens of thousands of years ago, when we were basically all still living in caves, we existed in small groups as hunter-gatherers, and life was short and brutish. It was essential that group cohesion exist and function as best as possible, because if it did not, death was the result. In order to bring about this cohesion, the perception that outside forces were a potential life-threatening danger was nigh essential, and this was especially true of those humans who did not belong to the local tribe or group. The outsider was a perceived threat, primarily because of competition for resources, sexual, food and shelter, etc. This outsider was almost invariably a male, not female because the male outsider was a threat for the in-group males in terms of provision and hence access to female reproductive resources. And this is what any form of tribalism really is. It is the formation of singular groups, usually of men, along various lines, racial, religious, political, even sportive, for the sake of co cohesion against a world that is perceived as hostile, whether rightly or not. It is a social manifestation of a survival instinct that was valid and useful 30,000 years ago, but has begun to malfunction in modernity and causes more problems than it solves. So the formation of a tribe in the modern sense will be based on the same old criteria that were present those many thousands of years ago, albeit in a different context. Instead of competition for mammoths and elk, the new playing field is economic, i.e. the labor market, and it becomes socioeconomic in nature with us primitive humans injecting the playing field with our tribalistic instincts and perceptions. To help understand this, I'm going to make use of two prominent 20th century manifestations of tribalism, the first one being the National Socialist Movement of Germany in the early 20th century, and the American South of the mid-20th, which Dean Esme specifically talks about in his response video. The form of tribalism we call National Socialism took root principally as a reaction in my assessment, to the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, which entailed the following main stipulations. One, Germany had to accept the blame for starting the war. That's Clause 231. Two, Germany had to pay uh, 6,600 million pounds, called reparations, for the damage done during the war. Three, Germany was forbidden to have any submarines or an air force. She could have a navy, but only six battleships, an army of just 100,000 men. In addition, Germany was not allowed to place any troops in the Rhineland and strip of land 50 miles wide next to France. And four, Germany lost territory land in Europe. Germany's colonies were given to Britain and France. Now, I'm not here to condemn or endorse the conditions of the Treaty of Versailles, but needless to say, it did in large measure 
lay the groundwork for the development of National Socialism by creating an economic environment in Germany that was unsustainable for the German population. Uh, specifically, I'm referring to the 1920s German economic crisis, brought about by high tariffs and the need to pay war reparations required by the Treaty of Versailles, and eventually leading to hyperinflation. And once again, I'm just stating the facts, not saying whether the conditions of the treaty were justified or not. And with that brief history lesson, we have the perfect environment for the perceived threat of extinction, and the perfect basis to form a tribe along primarily political lines, as well as pseudo-racial lines. And when such a tribe is formed, it will immediately seek out a perceived threat to the said tribe's existence. In this case, Jews, gypsies, dissenting political voices, homosexuals, disabled people, etc. Anything that is perceived as a threat to the survival of the more modern tribe, which means economic survival primarily, will be targeted and eliminated if need be. I mention this above because the outsider, more often than not, was and is a man, not a woman. If you recall my video on war brides and World War II dalliances between Nazi soldiers and women in conquered territories, you will see just how fluid the lines of tribal allegiance are, at least amongst women. I surmise that in the past, conquered women were more often than not assimilated into the conquering tribe, having uteruses they do, whereas the men were simply killed outright, or imprisoned, or enslaved. Thus the tribe is primarily a male manifestation. And you can see this in male allegiance to various football teams, such as Chelsea and Real Madrid, or the Yankees versus the Mets, or the Lions versus the Patriots, and so on and so forth. The sport-based tribe, however, is a relatively harmless manifestation of the tribe, or tribalistic mentality. It is nonetheless a manifestation of it. Uh, generally speaking, apart from the sisterhood itself, which it should be mentioned is not a tribe, but a sex or gender-based allegiance, women manifest no such tendencies to form tribes, since tribe forma tribal formation is based upon concerns for survival and reproduction specifically reproduction competition, where one group of males forms an alliance to outdo the other in order to maintain and or acquire assets for survival, and consequently assets for production. So whilst women are members of a tribe, they are rarely its founders. Now let us turn to the American South, because I believe one cannot understand the success of the Civil Rights Movement without understanding at least in part, the history of the South and why and how the racial tribalism so prominent there came to be. The starting point should be to understand that even 200 years ago, the North of the U.S. was far more of an industrialized economy and was ever more so as time moved forward than the sou Southern U.S. ever was. The Southern U.S. was and remained up until fairly recently an agrarian, agricultural-based economy. These differing circumstances create a foundation for the racist tribalism that was common in the South. Below are some passages taken from an essay written in 1880. Quote, the northern economy vastly differs from the southern economy. While northerners produce lumber, textiles, etc., the southern economy is based upon agriculture such as cotton, tobacco, rice, sugar, and indigo. The South wanted cheap imports, while the North used a variety of industries, and basically anything to do with machinery. Obviously, the difference in location affects the outcome of economy. Along with the economy, the Southern and Northern cities are very different as well. While in the North it was popular for people to live in the cities, most Southerners lived on farms in small towns along the coast. The South had numerous small towns which were self-sufficient, and the Northern towns were centers of trade and commerce. Population is a very large difference when it comes to the North and South. The North had a rapid population increase in the early 1800s, while the Northern population did not gain a lot of immigrants until about 1860. Most immigrants settled in the North rather than the South. In 1960, the North was populated with about 31 million people, while the South had only 20 million people. Unlike the North, the South owned slaves. Approximately 25% of the population were slave owners. Population plays a very large role concerning why the North and South are different. So what are some key things to note? The North was industry-based, the South agriculturally based. The North was far more urban, had many more immigrates, immigrants, and had larger conglomerations of people in one place, whereas the South had primarily small towns and farms. 
population of the North was also almost thrice as large as the South, including the slaves that lived there. Now, we go back to the origins of tribalism, and we can see that the South had an agricultural, non agricultural, non industry based economy, a much more spread out population, as well as a population smaller in number, and an economy that relied to a certain extent on slave labor to be maintained. If we examine the circumstances here, we can reasonably claim that the circumstances in the South mirrored the survive-or-die environment that originally engendered tribalism, much more so than the North, even if not perfectly, uh, in the 19th century and still more in the 20th. It is out of these circumstances that, moving ahead to the post-Civil War period, that we can see how race-based tribalism continued to persist. Of course, there was activism in the North. But most of the legwork for integration had already been done by the economic and demographic circumstances present in the North. Tribalism of any sort is much more likely to manifest itself in an environment of either limited economy and or limited resources, as well as sparse population. There seems to be a lot of evidence that the South never really completely recovered from the consequences of the Civil War, and thus blacks would all the more be seen as a competing socioeconomic class in this context which is why segregation policies were present in the first place, to limit competition in the socioeconomic sense. Once again, I'm going to argue that a change in the landscape, i.e. Larger, larger urban centers, integration of the economy in general, even if limited, that these were far more important in getting the groundwork done than activism. Once sufficient mechanization, urbanization, and greater population concentrations manifest themselves, tribalistic tendencies will almost automatically be reduced, i.e. racism will be reduced. And we can see this in some of the most successful nation states of modern Asia, such as Malaysia and Singapore, both of which are composed of diverse ethnic populations, all of whom are Malaysian and Singaporeans respectively, though speaking several different languages and being culturally and ethnically different and distinct as well. They're both small countries with very condensed populations and high degrees of mechanization and industrial development. Essentially, the more modern a state becomes, the less racism, i.e. Tri tribalism, we found there. The same cannot be said about feminism, which I will, I will get to shortly. Furthermore, despite tribalism being largely a natural byproduct of a survival mechanism to form groups to the exclusion of other groups, <clears throat> it is, as far as can be observed, largely a phenomenon that is further groomed by socialization or not, meaning it can be counteracted rather easily. If it weren't, it would not have been possible to have reduced it significantly, nor for that matter would you find the very common phenomenon of friendships amongst children with very different backgrounds, which can be seen all the time these days. Yet we find a very different picture with regards to the sexes, men and women. In contrast to children of the same sex but of differing ethnicities, the two sexes practice self-imposed segregation from a very early age onwards. Quote, another prominent feature of children's friendships is gender segregation, the tendency of children to associate with others of their same sex. Consider the situation we observed while testing four-year-old children in a preschool. As the children returned from their outside play period, a new boy in class took a seat in the circle of chairs. Several other boys ran immediately to him yelling, get up, that's where the girls sit. Hearing this, the new boy leapt up and began to furiously dust off the back of his pants. What did he think was on the chair? Cooties. There's no doubt that gender segregation exists. In fact, it is nearly universal, occurring in every cultural setting in which researchers have observed children selecting playmates. How does it begin and why? There are no clear answers to these questions, but we can learn more by looking at how gender segregation evolves across childhood and adolescence. And this is my own note here. Uh, I think it's quite clear, and maybe I'll talk about it another time as to why, but uh, that's another story and another tale for another time. By two to three years of age, children are beginning to show a clear preference for playing with other children of their own sex. At this age, children are more interactive and sociable when playing with same-sex friends. When they are with the opposite sex, they tend to watch or play along the other, alongside the other children rather intera interact directly. Gender segregation is very prominent after the age of three. Preschool children spend very little time playing one-on-one -on -one with the opposite sex. They spend some time in mixed sex groups, but spend most of their time, by far, playing with same-sex peers. By six years, segregation is so firm that if you watch six-year-olds on the playground, you should expect to see only one girl-boy group for every 11 boy-boy or girl groups. 
Now, the same claim cannot be made about same-sex peer children of differing backgrounds and or races, assuming proper socialization. They're really apples and oranges, completely different things. And speaking of which, the title of this rever uh, video refers to the, the apples and oranges situation that is feminism versus racism. And while both are fruit, i.e. they're both biological in origin, they are very different fruit indeed. At this point in time, you might be scratching your head as to why I'm talking about this at all. I'm talking about this because one argument you'll often hear is made along the lines of the civil rights movement in terms of men's rights. But just as apples and oranges are differing fruits, so too are feminism and racism very different animals. Consider for the moment, based upon what I have thus far elaborated on, namely the combined forces of mechanization, industrialization, larger population concentrations, as well as expanded job opportunities due to technology, that all of these things contribute to the attrition of racism and most other forms of tribalism. Combined, I might call this the globalization effect, and now with the internet and other intercontinental means of communication, it's taking place at an even faster rate. And that's what world, uh, worldwide interconnectivity inter, uh, does. It reduces the amount of tribalism we have. Yet, what do we observe with regards to feminism? We observe the exact opposite effect. The more mechanized the world becomes, the more urbanization takes place, the more job opportunities available we see. Not a retreat of feminism, but an advancement of it. And by that, I do not mean capital F feminism, but primarily of lowercase f feminism. That alone should give us all pause, because if we are to draw analogies between activism against racism and activism against feminism, because the former will be reduced over time if the aforementioned conditions are in place, activism playing in my eyes a relatively small role, at least compared to these other effects such as mechanization, population growth, urbanization, and the latter grows, latter being feminism, grows if aforementioned conditions are in place. Now Grow writes what? Uh, once said in a video that feminism is women by proxy, and no matter how loudly men uh, scream and shout the line that feminism is an ideology and women are a gender. Uh, because women have tacitly and at times loudly be compli been complicit in the growth of politicized feminism. So when one attacks the benefits that feminism have brought, have, has brought to women in terms of person privileges, it is rightly interpreted as an attack on women or, to be more specific, the special cookies they get. And frankly, how many women out there are willing to give up those cookies? Now, even considering all the other factors, civil rights was about equality under the law, whereas feminism was about equality when it suits women and get out free passes when it does not. But more to the point, women at worst in history lived under benevolent sexism in the past, but their lives were always valued and prioritized and preserved above those of men. Of, of those of men. When men created the conditions that led to modernization and mechanization, such that women were in a position to leave benevolent sexism behind, they did so in droves. And the world, specifically the world of men, granted their wish. Women have always been the primary concern of human beings. It's why, more often than not, women were assimilated into new tribes and men were eliminated in times of war in the past. And it's why 80% of our ancestors were women and only 40% were men. Tribal allegiances are malleable and can change and have changed, but the dynamic of women before men is universal and was never malleable. More than anything else, it was the cornerstone of the biological reproductive imperative and remains so, and remains very much imprinted in the minds of everyone, not on a subconscious level, but on an unconscious level. Now I'm going to quote something that Girl Rights, wrote, Girl Rights What wrote to me in a PM conversation, because I find it uh, fairly relevant to the discussion in hand. Quote, the only way we're going back is if we blow ourselves into the Stone Age, at which point people who've ever been de dependent on light, switch, light switches or a microwave will be very quickly dead, and patriarchy will become necessary. That, that means, and I believe a less thankless form and less severe relative to the conditions for everyone of male disposability. In other words, everyone will be suffering way more than now, and men will suffer the most. If we go forward on the path we are now, men will perhaps suffer less than they did 500 or 1,000 years ago, but relative to the treatment of women, they'll be more disposable than ever. 
Men had to be getting something out of the deal all through history, something valuable enough for it to at least seem worth the trade. There were ways for them to be useful to women, and society that didn't always demand that they be put through the grinder. But yes, being more useful than women is what establishes a man's value in the human community. The more women can be provided for and protected by faceless entities rather than individual man, the more you deprive him of the only currency with which to purchase the means to convince society to keep him around. Instead, everyone will focus, everyone will focus more and more on how much trouble he is to women, how harmful and dangerous, how predacious, how unfair and useless, how recalcitrant, and how unwilling, not unable because of hyperagency, he is to pay his own way. The past had wars that culled millions of men. The future, where we're going now, will have prisons and work camps where we'll put more and more men into who inconvenience women." End quote. So you see where all this is going? This is not simply a matter of activism, as we are combating something that most people act upon not subconsciously but unconsciously, so deeply rooted it is in our biology. Or put another way, everyone is walking around thinking the world functions according to principle A, where principle A is, well, Men, men have pa patriarchy and men have power and privilege, when in reality it is the converse, that the world functions according to principle B, quite the opposite. It is the millennia held belief that the world is based on principle A, that women suffered whilst men enjoyed privilege, that got us into the mess we currently are in, and why the world, and now it is truly the entire world, accepted feminism and everything women wanted with such willingness and desire and complacency. Gynocentrism and male disposability, these are the driving forces behind it all. Reversing that dynamic would require reverse engineering the human animal from the bottom up, and I don't see that happening. But now, as I'm nearing the end, I want to briefly address a statement that Bob O'Hara made in the interview that I had with him. And it should be clear, I have nothing against Bob. He seems like a nice guy, and I enjoyed talking to him. It's more about the statement itself that I uh, feel um, somewhat obligated to uh, address. Now, at 9.50 of the interview, Bob states, quote, if we just change the law, so many of these problems would go away, unquote. <clears throat> and my question is simply, would they? Looking past the fact that the laws would just be a lock put on the cage of the beast, not to change the beast itself, let's take a classic such as no-fault divorce. In earlier times, there had to be pressing reasons to file for, di for divorce, two of the most common of which were infidelity and physical abuse. These days, women can file for divorce because the husband did not buy her an expensive enough dinner. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that we get rid of no-fault divorce. Would so many of these problems go away, as Bob suggests? Now, in another interview with uh, Colonel Absconder, a caller called in and told the story of he had caught his of how he had caught his ex-girlfriend cheating on him, and went to confront her about it. Whereupon she called the police and had him arrested for purportedly abusing her. He pled guilty, so he did not have to uh, serve in jail, but rather had to attend some sort of correctional program instead to better his you know, "quote unquote" wayward ways. Given women's inclination in the already uh, no-fault divorce atmosphere to cite abuse and infidelity as causes and reasons, even if purely fictitious, would doing away with no-fault, uh, the no-fault aspect, help or hurt men in the long run? The past five decades have shown us that women have at best a passing interest in marriage and at worst are not interested at all to the extent that they're involved in it. And the only, means if, the only means available to women under an at-fault divorce system are allegations of domestic abuse and infidelity. When they are already very willing to make such allegations under the current system, what would stop an inflationary expansion of such, such claims when such claims are women's only manner of egress from marriage? Regardless of the truth of such claims, we all need to think critically about this question and similar ones, because making statements such as if we just change the laws does not take into account the last 50 plus years of observable history. And given that women have made false allegations of domestic abuse and infidelity under no-fault divorce, I am inclined to believe that the number of such claims and charges would increase, not dwindle, if no other means were available to women to leave marriage. Remember, for 50 plus years, women have been groomed and indoctrinated to, to have been able to get out of marriage on a whim, to do what they want on a whim. Reversing that will not change 
what they are accustomed to and might even leave them to commit to even more extreme for forms of behavior. behavior. Just a thought. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that I'm in favor of no-fault divorce. I'm simply pointing out that simply changing the laws, assuming it can be done, which I do not believe given our biological legacy, without regard to the previous decades and assuming all will be well, is naive at best. Now, before Dean Esme calls me the Satan amongst Eeyores, I will tell you what I believe to be a better course of action than activism, at least in terms of men's rights and men's issues. This would be simply the dissemination of information. Because of the biological barriers in place that inform policy, I do not see a path forward in activism, but if progress is to be made at all, it must be done on a case-by-case -case basis where we pass along information. The informed man and the indeed very rare informed woman will profit far more if all our efforts are put into getting information out there. An example of this is that uh, I recently changed my signature, and this is just an example, on Bioware forums to link to Girl Rights What's videos, and I wrote in the signature uh, calling them some of the most important videos anyone is ever likely to see. Now this has to spark people's curiosity, even if they have no interest in the topic itself, and Girl Rights What, being the hallmark reader as she refers to herself, is also a perfect introduction to Blue Pillars. I'm certainly not the perfect introduction, nor is Barbarossa, nor are many others. There are many means, uh, both large and small, of disseminating information. Start your own channel, that's one option. And recently, uh, Vention One, um, I'm going to post a link to his channel. A man who's going his way for many, going his own way for many years, started his own channel and provided some very valuable information to viewers. In short, more voices, the more voices we have out there, disseminating information, passing information along, not screaming in the voice of activism, but explaining and using reasoned arguments, the better, better off we will be, and the more likely we will, we will be to affect change from the bottom up, because it will certainly will not happen from the top down, no matter how loudly you clamor for it. Thanks for watching.